Welcome, everyone. I'm Neil Abram, president of the Waitley Historical Society, and we're pleased to hold and host the joint annual meeting of the Hatfield Historical Society and the Waitley Historical Society um, today for the talk that you will hear in just a few moments. Let me introduce a few of the other leading lights of the Waitley Historical Society, and then I think Rob wants to say something to, on behalf of the uh, Hatfield Historical Society. So our Vice President is Larry Ashman. Wave a hand, Larry. Our Secretary is Gretchen Bechter. Gretchen in the back. Our Treasurer is Bill Saunders, right here. Our archivist is Derricka Smith, who has recently authored a brief supplemental history of Waitley, both earlier eras and more recent ones than the several uh, other histories previously written. We're selling copies for $10. And Jane Gripko is our curator. Society. The most recent past president is Adelia Bardwell. Yeah. And prior to her presidency, Lois Dean. Uh -huh. yeah. So we're pleased to host you. If you haven't already visited, you should look at the exhibit that opens today downstairs in our museum. And if you stick around after the talk, we'll raise the screen. And you get, you get to see a curtain that was made in the uh, late 1930s or early 1940s uh, as part of a business of making free curtains for various Grange halls and town halls. And the way they paid for them was to ask you to give a list of all the local businesses who bought ads. So we have the advertising curtain that includes advertisements from Waitley businesses, uh, sorry, from uh, Waitley and Hatfield and Greenfield and Northampton businesses uh, from back in the late 1930s. So we'll do a reveal of that after the talk. So Rob, you wanted to say something on behalf of the Hatfield Historical Society? Thanks very much. And first of all, thank you, Hatfield Historical Society, for collaborating on this with the did I say thank you, Hatfield? <laughs> well, I'd like to thank the Hatfield Historical Society on behalf of ourselves, but mainly I want to thank you, uh, the Waitley Historical Society, for collaboration and for um, this opportunity to speak to you tonight. It's brief. Basically, as you probably all know, we're a nonprofit organization. We do have a curator and an assistant curator, and we do various things to raise money in order to uh, to pay them. And we also have expenses. And we are running a raffle this year. And the good news is you don't have to be from Hatfield to, to play it. You, can, you have an equal opportunity to win. And there's really some, some pretty cool prizes, including if any of you have children or grandchildren or friends that come to visit you and you're not quite sure where to put them other than your attic or your basement. The, the um, Old Mill Inn in Hatfield has given, a, given us a, a, a two night stay there and um, that's up to a $500 value. And there's a couple of restaurant opportunities and Lisa Eckes publishing cookbooks as prizes. So there's a stack of these envelopes over there on the table. And if you're feeling lucky, or even if you're not feeling lucky, please, Please pick one up and buy a ticket. The uh, deadline is the 24th of March, so you still have plenty of time. And if you play, may the odds be permanently in your favor. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Rob. And let me also introduce the president of the uh, Greenfield Historical Society, who's with us tonight, Carol Allen. Um, <laughs> and the 
Street City downstairs would not have been possible if they had not wanted to get rid of some of their display cases. So two of the display cases down in our museum came from the Greenfield Historical Society. So, so thank you, Carol. Um, hi, I'm Donna Wiley. Welcome. Uh, three of us, Allison Bell, Maida Goodwin, and I have been working for um, seven or eight months on the exhibit downstairs, which is about Roaring Brook, a part of Waitley that we've learned many people in Waitley have never heard of and never seen. Um, our interest in the uh, topic really grew out of the fact that we found a handful of dim old photographs in the Historical Society collection, and we wanted to learn a little bit about them. And what we found is that um, as time went on, we had gotten into a research project that has to do with geography and industry and art, agriculture, tourism, and a wonderful dispute with Conway and Deerfield about access to drinking water. Um, the, I guess, bad punchline is that Deerfield won. Our, our work took us all over the valley, and we found um, good friends and um, help I'm going to list all of our collaborators at the Jones Library in Amherst, the Forbes in Northampton, the UMass Archives, the Smith College Archives, the Mount Holyoke Museum of Art, Historic Northampton, and the libraries at Pocumtuck Valley Memorial Association and Historic Deerfield. Not to mention, of course, our primary partners in Hatfield, and I want to especially thank Meg Baker, who was extremely helpful. Um, we spoke with local experts, including geologist John Brady from Smith, and we asked many questions of longtime Waitley residents who remembered things that none of the three of us remembered. So uh, thank you to everyone. Um, so what did we find? We found this enormous trove of photographs, letters, journals, historic newspaper references, all kinds of pieces that told a story that had never been connected before. Um, and it's still incomplete, and we're still trying to figure some things out. Um, sometimes the evidence was misleading. Often images were sort of labeled or labeled in ways that took us in a wrong path, um, often inconclusive. And there are lots of things we haven't figured out yet. And I'm just going to give you two examples, which are not directly pertinent to the talk subject we have tonight, but sort of interesting one. Um, Laura Sanderson, born and bred on Glen Road, Waitley Glen Road, was a noted poet. She wrote the chapter on, on Waitley Glen in the crafts history of this town of 1899. Why did she move to Indianapolis all on her own and start a business college for women and lived the rest of her life there? That's in the next project <laughs> category. Why was a ladies' art club in Sacramento named for Elbridge Kingsley in 1892. We haven't yet figured that out either, but um, those are just two sort of funny examples. Um, but our topic tonight is not Roaring Brook and all of these um, aspects of it. It's specifically um, King, the Kingsley brothers, who were artists um, and who worked in Waitley Glen and Roaring Brook, among other places. So I'm just going to tell you a couple of things about them. Um, Elbridge Kingley, Kingsley was the best known of six brothers. Um, and he was born in Carthage, Ohio in 1841. And I say that simply because another thing that intrigues us is that the family moved to Hatfield soon thereafter. And that would have been in the opposite direction than most people would have been moving across this country at that time. So that also goes in a, we need to learn more about that sometime. Um, another one of his brothers um, was also a photographer and artist, Lewis. And um, you at the Hatfield Historical Society have a beautiful, beautiful collection of his glass negatives, which we've um, really enjoyed getting to know. And then there was also Stephen Kingsley, who lived on North Street, who lived in Judy and Bill's house in, in North Street in Waitley until he died in 1932. As far as we can tell, the Kingsley brothers roamed as far south as Brooklyn and as far east as Worcester. That was their trajectory. Um, and 
we think their photos and paintings capture life and landscape in Western Massachusetts in the late 19th century in a, a really wonderful, wonderfully evocative way. Um, my partner, Allison Bell, is going to tell you a lot more about the Kingsley brothers and their work in Roaring Brook. So please welcome her. How's that, everybody? Good? OK, good. Uh, well, welcome, um, and thanks for that introduction, Donna. Um, we're here tonight to talk about these two Kingsley brothers, Elbridge and Lewis. And really, I think there's lots of stories we can tell. But I, the story I'm going to talk about tonight is how their artistic careers made a local, regionally known stream called Roaring Brook into a national uh, landmark and na even internationally known place. Uh, go ahead, Neil. And one more. One more. These were for Donna. I meant to tell her if she had slides, but there. Uh, I thought I'd start just by orienting us where we are. Um, it's a map of Waitley and to the south Hatfield. We are connected, as you can see, by uh, Roaring Brook, which feeds into the Mill River. So we could hop in our canoe uh, on Roaring Brook and end up pretty close down to the Historical Society in Hatfield if we wanted to. The water that comes down out of Roaring Brook goes into the Mill River, so it flows right down through Hadley. Um, go to the next slide, uh, Neil. This is a map of the section of Roaring Brook in Waitley. Uh, the stream runs from the west to the east. Its headwaters are in Conway, up near Cricket Hill, which is about 1,200 feet up. And they flow down uh, first into the uh, uh, Roaring Brook Reservoir, just over the Conway line, and then down into Waitley through the uh, waterfalls in Waitley Glen down into the ag agricultural fields across North Street, and then it confluence with the Mill River uh, out in the uh, wildlife management area in the Great Swamp. So the headwaters, as I said, are, are in, the, in the uplands in Conway. Um, there's a half a dozen little streams that start as uh, springs and uh, little beaver ponds and run, run downhill into the reservoir. Go ahead, Donna. Uh, there are two reservoirs on Roaring Brook, uh, and as Donna said, those have their own stories of controversy, and um, uh, this is the one that was built in 1902. The, the newer one that is close to Roaring Brook Road in Conway was built in 1975. Donna mentioned industry and settlement. Uh, Roaring Brook, just like many, many New England streams around here, um, had mill action on it industry on it. The early grist mill was built in 1763, and there was a sawmill and a carting mill built in the early 19th century further downstream. Plenty of agriculture in the flatlands where Roaring Brook uh, meets the Mill River Valley. This is in the Sami farm, which some of you might remember. It's uh, one in a long line of agricultural enterprises. Uh, that go back centuries. Uh, this is the Sami Farm became the New England Wildflower Society, which is the Native Plant Trust, and their property is on the banks of the Roaring Brook. And this is a shot of in the Great Swamp. This is the Mill River coming down, and Roaring Brook there on the right, where it passes through a number of beaver dams and really wonderful wetlands full of wildlife, um, and joins up uh, to flow south to Hatfield. So that's, that's the very brief overview of, of what is sort of the unremarkable history of, of a stream in New England. You could say it, some of those things about most streams uh, in Massachusetts. But what, what happened at Waitley Glen was it became a very popular tourist destination. It started in the 1860s when two Waitley congregational ministers decided to make it uh, a public picnic ground. They helped clean it up and built some trails and encouraged their congregation to go and enjoy it. 
And uh, starting in the 1860s, we have found newspaper ads, and in every decade, uh, for almost a century, of all kinds of groups of people who enjoyed going to Waitley Glen uh, for, the, for the waterfalls, for the shade, for the fishing, uh, for the botanizing, um, and the restorative quality of, of, of a cool, cool, wonderful place. This is the Smith students in 1889 posing for a picture on the rocks. One thing that uh, Roaring Brook can claim that is hard uh, for, I uh, can't think of another stream that can. Uh, in 1910, the Edison Movie Company chose Roaring Brook to film a recreation of the Battle of Bloody Brook as part of a movie they made called Ananko's Vow, which uh, loosely and romantically paralleled uh, the story of the 1704 attack on Deerfield, but began with the uh, Bloody Brook attack in 1675. And when the Edison people were looking around for a place to do the filming uh, in 1910, Bloody Brook in South Deerfield was already quite developed and didn't look anything like the wilderness they wanted it to look like. So they came out uh, uh, Elm Street, this is before 91, when you could come straight out Elm Street into Waitley, and they used Roaring Brook as the scene of their movie. And downstairs in the museum, we have a video screen with a short clip of the Bloody, Br uh, Bloody Brook slash Roaring Brook uh, scene from that movie where the natives are attacking the English, uh, English settlers. It, remarkable because when they made that movie, they enlisted at least 60 local guys to be the extras, both English and native, and news got out that the movie was being made, and this was such a sensation that they counted a thousand people came by trolley uh, from surrounding towns just to watch. So I don't know of an event that has brought a thousand people to Waitley for an afternoon <laughs> that's happened since and may not happen again. So that do thereby doubling the population of the town uh, for a moment. So there's a silver screen aspect to that that makes it pretty interesting. So let's drift downstream, back downstream, down to Hatfield, um, and start with uh, the Kingsleys. You can see the blue, I've highlighted the stream in blue, and down there in the bottom, in the uh, pink circle, is the Kingsley neighborhood. Um, you all probably know where that is, near the, is it the a American Legion or the VFW? I get it confused. American Legion. American Legion, uh, and the cemetery, and where the river crosses under the road. Uh, that is where the Kingsley uh, homestead was. And so those Kingsley kids grew up with the Mill River in their backyard, um, and so they were very familiar with that. Here's a picture Lewis took in the 1880s of his neighborhood, those are uh, the Kingsley houses, um, and that's what it looked like for them. And this is the backyard, I imagine, the Mill River, uh, that Lewis took quite a few pictures of the Mill River, uh, which he, uh, had access to, but was, um, must have been very interested in. So the boys uh, grew up, they went to uh, Hatfield Schools and Hopkins Academy, um, and 1870s, they are both working at a company called the Star Printing Company in Northampton, Massachusetts. And just by chance, not too long ago, uh, my friend Lori Sanders helped me find, they have the sign for the Star Printing Company at Historic Northampton which is a pretty groovy looking sign. Um, but in 1870, these are, these are excerpts from the newspaper. Uh, the, the company started in 1872. Uh, they're exhibiting work and working for the local colleges, just as the printers are still doing today. They're making their living off the local college work. Um, and then 1875, there was a notice that Elbridge had retired, I'm not sure what that means, left star printing uh, to start something else. Next one. This is from the Waitley Historical, no, I'm sorry, this is from the Historic Northampton uh, archives, but this is a reference to Waitley. These are letters from Elbridge Kingsley to J.M. Crafts, who you might recognize the name as the uh, family that's involved in the pottery business in town. And Elbridge is writing to Mr. Crafts about a job he is supposed to be doing for him. Um, the, the, letter on the left starts off by saying, you must be wondering about your label, as if he's behind in getting this work done. And the second, the second note uh, says, I've, I've done your proof at last, but it's going to cost you more. So some things never change. 
it sounds like the work uh, I have going on now. Um, so there's evidence that he's in business for himself in 1875, trying, trying to run his own um, wood engraving and lithography business. Uh, he is also in the mid-70s, Elbridge is, taking classes from uh, James Well Champney, the painter who's from Deerfield, whose house you may know there on Main Street. Uh, this is one of Champney's paintings. Uh, we've got people actually looking out over Waitley there and Sunderland. Um, but uh, Kingsley Elbridge was taking uh, painting lessons and, and with a colleague, Charles Burley, who was also a landscape artist, um, and, and trying to further his artistic interests. Also in the 1870s is when Elbridge and Lewis make their first trip to Waitley Glen. And this is an excerpt from Elbridge's autobiography that's at the Forbes Library, um, explaining how he went with Mr. Snow, who was his printing colleague, uh, to the Glen with his brother, and they took their camera to get some views. So it's a, a neat moment in capturing uh, their first forays into the Glen, and it, they went and turned it into an art occasion while they were there. 1878, we see the notice that Elbridge is in New York, and he's left Hatfield and uh, is working in New York at in the magazine trade. They mentioned Scribner's in here, and this is where his wood engraving career really starts to take off. In the 1870s, or in the 60s, mid-century, there was an enormous boom in uh, the production of popular magazines. Uh, there was both the technology to print um, a lot of them. We had the paper resources. We were busy cutting down forests in the Adirondacks in New Hampshire and, and floating the logs down the river to Holyoke so we could make paper to make these magazines. We were right in the middle of this whole thing. But the boom in popular magazines meant that there was a great need for illustrators. And in, in, at that time, illustration meant wood engraving. Uh, this is before, uh, there certainly photography existed, but there was no technology to take photographs and reproduce them in print yet. And that is kind of a theme through all this because it was certainly something that was coming. And in the end, the punchline is, uh, the advent of, of photographic printing was the death knell to uh, people in the wood engraving business. But for now, in the, in the late 1870s, uh, Elbridge is very busy working for magazines. They had um, small armies at these magazines who cranked out engravings. Go to the next one, Donna. Uh, wood engravings. And you all from Hatfield, I'm sure, uh, have a certain familiarity with wood engraving in that you've probably seen Barry Moser's work. It's still being done. He's a very famous wood engraver. Um, and it's something of an irony to me that in this large production of uh, magazines and newspapers, it was the wood engraving that they used in the process, not the steel or the copper engraving, which is a process where the ink is, goes into the lines that are cut. In wood engraving, the ink is on the material that's left, and the ink stays on top, just, just like it did with a type. And the, the wood that they used was very fine-grained boxwood ends, and it held up to the thousands and thousands and thousands of impressions that were needed to produce um, a Harper's Weekly magazine or a Scribner's Monthly magazine. Uh, the wood was so precious that it often took, even for a small illustration, several blocks put together. And you can see here in this one the seams uh, the kind of grid that shows, those are the blocks as they're glued together to make a block even, even this big. Wood engraving was very suitable for um, reproducing drawings, pen and ink drawings, as uh, Winslow Homer's drawing here, because you're just taking black lines and replacing them with black lines. So that was a very good use of wood engravings, and you've got accurate reproductions of things. But the challenge was um, to use wood engraving, which is a black and strictly black and white process, to reproduce other kinds of art. Painting, for example. This is a Bierstadt painting of Yosemite uh, with a wood engraving done by John Davis, who has turned out to be a pal, a big pal of Elbridge Kingsley's later on, trying to reproduce the same thing without color. But it was a way for the public to see this art because there was no other way. There's no TV, there's no color printing. This is how, how this art was made accessible to people. 
And the wood engravers who were doing these things were caught between both being able to make a living uh, doing the wood engraving because it, there were, it was uh, very um, popular, but they were also uh, criticized for not really being true artists. They were, in a sense, copying other people's art or interpreting other people's art. And you get the sense from Elbridge through his all, for decades of his writing, he had a big chip on his shoulder about sort of being a commercial artist as opposed to a true artist. But I guess so, yeah. So you, you, this is a, this is a, a dilemma that, that tears him back and forth. He's both trying to make a living by doing the commercial thing, but really wishes he could be a fine artist just like Albert Bierstadt or Winslow Homer and make it that way, but that's a hard thing to do. Go ahead. Uh, he did do art for its own sake, and um, sometimes those are prints that he made that would be sold through galleries, just as you would today, or special illustrations for books. He did a number of special books. This is a, was a very famous work of his called the New England Elms, and this is Hadley, Massachusetts, back in the age of the great elm tree. But a big moment came, and I, think, I, I, I don't think it was completely thought out when he, when he did it, but in 1878, he had a wagon built, a uh, mobile studio, yeah, and it was called an artist's car or a sketching car, it was essentially a mobile, um, both uh, sleeping, you know, RV kind of unit. It had, it had a cot and it had kitchen facilities, but it also had his art studio things in it. And it could be kind of folded up and hitched up to horses and pulled around to uh, various local venues, which he did. And it enabled him to um, make prolonged visits to his favorite spots and, and stay just like your RV would today. Um, but you can imagine this thing, you can imagine this thing pulling through the center of Hatfield and what a spectacle just in itself it would have been. It, it, it echoes um, what he would have known about, uh, this is a photo by Clifton Johnson of um, uh, a caravan in Europe You've all seen those kind of things, so he would have known about those. But it was very common also for traveling photographers or tradesmen or portrait painters um, to have their own traveling carts with their gear, and they travel from town to town. So he was echoing that kind of idea with his own, with his own cart. But it was quite distinct, and everybody seemed to know when it came through town, and it usually made the paper when it came through town, if only a statement that said, Elbridge Kingsley pulled his cart through Hatfield today on his way to so-and-so. Um, but it, it, as I say, it, it, it allowed him to go to favorite spots uh, like Waitley Glen and even bring along company um, and, stay, and stay for weeks at a time. So this is a photo from the um, Waitley Historical Society collection that we have, and it, it exists in a couple, there's, there's several copies of it that we've seen that exist different places. But this is his cart set up, we're not sure where, and a lot of these times we're not sure where the cart is. Um, but he's got, uh, he has family come see him, he has friends come see him, the locals who are curious come visit and hang out with him for the day. But he also starts to invite his fancy New York City artist friends, uh, other wood engravers, or newspaper editors uh, to come and stay, and it becomes um, a little bit of a, an occasion in itself and a self-promoting occasion. He arranges with his editors at the Century Magazine. He lets them know that he's planning to do, you see notices, he's planning to go do this thing in October, so that makes the news. Then you see in the newspapers he is doing the thing in October, and that makes the news. And then you see later in magazines the articles that are published with the artwork um, that he's created while doing it. So he's, he's getting himself in the spotlight. He's using his magazine connections. He's using his friends who are also engravers and publishers to get his name out there and known. And pretty soon you start seeing the words Elbridge Kingsley, the famous Elbridge Kingsley, the world-renowned Elbridge Kingsley. And the more he calls himself famous and world-renowned, 
the more he is referred to as famous and it's, it's, it's self-perpetuating. But even the car itself, as here, becomes the object of art itself. And a lot of other artists end up drawing the car um, as much as they do the scenery. This all kind of comes to a, a, a head in the late 1880s. And this is at a time, again, when photography is now starting to appear they figured out a half-tone process to reproduce photographs. Not quite there yet, but photographs are starting to be used in these magazines and newsletters. They're much cheaper. Uh, they don't take as long. You don't need an army of people carving away to make them. Um, and you can tell that the engravers are feeling the pressure, and they're starting to sort of speak of themselves almost as an endangered species. And some of them are peeling off, like Elbridge does eventually. He leaves wood engraving and, and looks at painting and looks at drawing and looks at teaching. But in 1889, um, there's a big camp out on the side of Mount Holyoke. They go up to uh, where Titan's Piazza is. He has his car <laughs> hauled up there. And he's got four or five different artists who are joining him there. Uh, and this is a photo. Uh, I think Lewis might have took, taken it, or Clifton Johnson took it, um, of the camp out they had there. You can tell it's on Mount Holyoke. You've got chunks of basalt on the ground. And they've got the cart, the famous cart you recognize is on the left. They've made a little <coughs> lean-to studio on the right. Uh, the school kids uh, from down the hill at Hockenham, you know, the Hockenham Schoolhouse on 47, walk up the hill to go see the famous artist and his cart and all his friends. It's a, it's a, it's a big deal. Yeah, and then, then they start producing art from the moment itself. And all fall in the magazines, in several of the magazines, there are at least four or five different artists who are writing and illustrating their story about how they were on Mount Tom with the famous sketching card and the world-renowned Elbridge Kingsley uh, <laughs> making art, uh, doing wood engraving. And all of this is by way of saying the more they talk about Elbridge and where he goes, the more Waitley Glen became a better known place to people all over the country who may not ever have come here but would read about it. And this is, this is the part where uh, I wanted to show something of our journey in visiting the various resources looking for these images because half a dozen places each had a picture of the sketching car without any much detail or explanation about it. And the more we found, the more we started to put together these photographs to understand what they meant. So we have this photo from Forbes on the left, which was called Old Barn. And we've got Elbridge Kingsley standing there, scratching his head in the, in the middle. And then we've got a photo from the Jones Library, which you can see is the same old barn. And Elbridge is wearing the dark hat on the left. And there's his buddy, uh, John Davis. And they're staging a little dinner scene there. But you can see they've propped up their canvases. So you understand they're doing art. And um, they're, they're making dinner. And so there's two, play, two photos of this place. And it made us very curious to figure out where this really was. So here's a few more pictures We're from the Jones Library. There's the card again. There's Elbridge Kingsley and John Davis, and there's that building again in the background. And there it is again from, that's Lewis's picture from the Hatfield Historical Society, uh, unlabeled. Lewis's picture is dazzling in its detail. Those, those glass negatives are just gem-like. You can see even there's a Phoebe's nest over the doorway, and you can see every twig in the nest. Um, but there's on the right, Elbridge in the long painter's coat and John Davis lolling around with this door open to the space. And here's the space. If you look inside, uh, suddenly I realized they're using the indoor room there as a studio. You see the paintings up on the wall? So we connected it to this picture over here, also from the Jones. There, there they are, same building. And there's Elbridge Kingsley. He's painting. Um, and you can see all the trappings of all the sketches and art and stuff that they're doing. So this picture sort of starts to come together of this place, and we get become more and more curious about where is this, because it's not Mount Holyoke, and we don't think it's in Hatfield. And then we see these pictures, and now we're looking at what we think, this, the one on the right is unpopulated, there's no person in it, but it appears to be the ruins of a dam and probably a mill. 
Uh, looks like the dam is blown out and the stream is running through it. And then you can see on the left, clearly the same structure, but later and in worse condition. And here's our guy, John Davis, sitting on his stool, painting a picture of what, exactly what is in front of him there, the, the ruins of the mill and the dam. And uh, got us to really being curious about where this is. So I started studying the details of this picture. And one thing I can see is, in the one on the right, up through the ruins, you can just catch a glimpse of that sketching car up in the second story. There's a little bit of it, if you get a magnifying glass out. You can see the sketching cars on the other side. So this seems to be the same place as those previous pictures, just the other side. And then I'm looking at the stone wall that is on the left-hand side of that picture that has that white board going across it. And here's a detail of it up here. Do you see the stones and the pattern that they make? I realize I've seen that pattern before in this picture. You compare the stonework. Those are the same rocks. And I know that I took this picture, next slide, in Waitley Glen. This is the ruins of the mill, the mill foundation in Waitley Glen. Here's, here's that detail again, and you can see it up in the corner. It's just that now, this is what it looks like now. There's no wood, there's no structure, there's not anything. This is a maple, maple sap tubing operation that's running through the middle of it. But those are the same rocks, and that tells us all those pictures then were taken along Roaring Brook at Waitley Glen, and we did not know that before. Nor, nor have, have we ever seen a picture of a mill in Waitley before. So that was just uh, part of the adventure we had, and, and it's what makes these kind of projects really kind of fun when you find these sort of treasures. So I think I will leave it there, and I'm happy to, this is uh, Lewis's lovely picture, again, taken in the 1880s when he was uh, uh, in business as a photographer. Lovely picture of Waitley Glen at the base there, and there it is today, same, same spot. There you go. Huh. How about that? Oh, thank you. How do you know that that spot drew a lot of tourists from far and wide? Uh, well, they did, actually. So, so at one point later on in the 19th century, the Sanderson family began to run it as a paying enterprise. And they charged admission. In, at the turn of the century, they were charging a dime to get in. So, so this, Waitley Glen had a long run from the 1860s up to the turn of the century. We have photos of Myra Sanderson uh, charging admission, sitting on the stile. And the sign says, you pay your dime at the house. And they would record how many guests they got. And they'd publish it in the paper. And you'd get a report, every summer there'd be a report, oh, things at the Glen are great, the water's high, the, you know, they've caught a lot of trout, and so far there's been 1,000 visitors. Or last year there were 3,000 visitors. So it was, it was very well visited, and not just by people from Waitley. It was a destination, it was on the list of things to do, you know, when you came to the valley, you went to Mount Toby, and uh, you went to, through Old Deerfield, and you went to Waitley Glen, and it, it, was, it was one of the places one went. And when the trolley came through, um, right at the turn of the century, 1902, it made it even more accessible to people who could come up from Springfield uh, by the train and then take the trolley and then walk over to the Glen or get a, get a ride over to the Glen. Do you know where it was advertised so that visitors would learn of it? The magazines that mentioned it? Uh, I have not seen that. There was a, 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 a photographer named Frederick Neeland who worked out of Northampton who published a pamphlet called um, something like Local Drives. And by that he meant get on your wagon with your horse and drive. Um, local Drives, and he, it was, it was kind of one of those tourist maps. He gave the destinations and how many miles and what the best route was. And Waitley Glen was certainly one of the places. And the, and the back page of this uh, pamphlet is an ad for Waitley Glen, published by Charles Sanderson, who was running the Waitley Glen uh, picnic area and extolled all the virtues of, of why it was such a beautiful place to go.
And the more, if you read Century, if you're sitting in East Oshkosh, Wisconsin, you would read in your Century magazine about the famous Elbridge Kingsley and his buddies camping out and having a wonderful time in Waitley Glen. You'd know that was a place you needed to go see. Yes. Um, is Waitley Glen on public property now? Private? It has never been on public property. It is on private property. Is, is it accessible by? Uh... It's on private property. You'd need special permission to go there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, part of the story is that at one time, uh, again, 1920s, uh, the trustees of reservations and the Appalachian Mountain Club were very busy putting together lists of places they felt like should be preserved and saved as um, for landscape reasons, conservation reasons. And Waitley Glen was on the list along with a lot of other places you would recognize, like Chapel Falls and Petticoat Hill and Mount Toby, and uh, but Waitley Glen was never um, was never publicly owned. There, there are public. Uh, the Roaring Brook has some public property. Part of it's owned by the Water District up high, and there's a wildlife management area at the bottom end that is public property. Okay. Other, well, que other questions? So, any um, movies? Nobody, movie stars at that time that <laughs> came up. Well, if you were in Anonco's Val, you were a movie star. There was a movie star who had an accident in Whiteley, but that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you. Neil? So, so thank you all very much. There are refreshments in the back. And we're